So, hello and welcome to Bedtime Stories, part of the Architecture Foundation's 100-day studio. Alicia Pavaro has invited different voices from the world of architecture to share their favourite book. And so, my reading tonight is The Encounter, Amazon Beaming, by Petru Popescu, a book which was adapted and performed at the Barbican in 2016 by Simon McBurney of Theatre Complicité whose introduction to the book I'll begin with. This story is a journey and an encounter. It is both salutary and necessary to have our assumptions challenged in the self-centered times that we live in. To really consider the idea that we are interconnected, inseparable from one another, just as we are inseparable from nature, even when we do not think of ourselves as living in nature, to truly accept that we are part of the ecosystem wherever we are and that we cannot escape it, just as we cannot escape the planet. We need to acknowledge that there is another way of seeing the world and our place in it. So in 1969, Lauren McIntyre, working for the National Geographic magazine, journeys by float plane to the Amazon basin in a quest to find and photograph the Mayaruna, or cat people, a tribe at this point presumed extinct. Having barely arrived, he almost immediately makes contact with the elusive tribe and follows them into the wild depths of the rainforest. When he realises he is lost, it is already too late. With no possibility of returning to base camp, he has no choice but to stay with them. Diary entry, October 20th. Took good pictures of the group I contacted and stand good chance to take pictures out of here. I wonder what I'm starting by photographing these people. I'm not keen on seeing them inundated by government agents and scientists. They have no defences against germs from the outside, which are invariably brought in by regular contact. Unfortunately, the best safeguard for leaving Indian life un unadulterated is really not to contact them but I am alone and won't be here for more than a few days. My effect on them will be limited and hopefully unlasting. At a glance, it looked as if this community had just chosen its new location. There were more than eight or nine huts. Lauren scanned the clearing and counted 14 in all, most of them still being worked on. He knew the Indians could whip up temporary shelters in under an hour. A general air of improvisation hung over the place. An hour before dusk, he was adopted by a family of four who offered him the use of a hammock in their hut. He was rudely awakened. A pair of hands were shaking the hut's central post. Like ripe fruits, the brown bodies of Lauren's host plopped out of their suspended beds. An explorer groggily grabbed his camera and other possessions and touched down only seconds after his host. Mist boiled over the village ground and the fallen tree. Above it, as if knitted into the canopy, the dark looked all powerful. Yet the jagged screen of the Macaws already trumpeted the start of a new day. The hammocks were being rolled up and the head of the household motioned for Lauren to do the same with his, while the head of the household thrashed powerfully at the central post with a club of chonta palm. The post broke. The roof came down. On his right and left, other huts were coming down. The tribe's people were demolishing their huts and lean-tos quickly without any apparent regret. Baskets went up and were balanced on heads and little children were strapped on women's backs, secured with trump lines around their mother's foreheads. The six-foot bows and arrows, the hurling clubs, the spears and harpoons were clutched in tribesmen's palms. The squirrel monkeys on leashes of twine were hitched to wrists and forearms and the pet birds were made to perch on shoulders and even on thick manes of hair. As if listening to an unspoken command, the column broke forward as soon as it was fully formed. Where the hell are they going again? Was all that his mind could articulate. He was part of they. He walked swiftly along like a mayoruna whose possessions happened to be a pen, a notebook, a camera. 
This is the third day of my strange captivity. I had fallen asleep with my camera against my hip, but now it wasn't in the hammock and I couldn't see it anywhere. I tore the hammock open and searched its whole length, then threw myself under it and lunged out onto the other side into the grass. I saw nothing rectangular and black anywhere. I rose, pivoted around in my hot sneakers, rushed back to the crowd. I zigzagged back and forth, almost ready to grab them and open their clenched fists to see if they clutched pieces of my camera. But these people were so disarmingly naked, they couldn't hide my camera anywhere on their bodies. I angled back across the clearing, wondering whether to storm the huts and knock over the household baskets. Slow down, slow down. In such a situation, calm, cool headedness was critical. I could hear my heart pounding furiously and I felt my blood racing. I had been awake about 20 minutes. A thought flashed up in my mind. I need to know. It felt like my own thought, but an instant later, I wondered whether that was Barnacle, the head man thinking it. I need to know. I stepped towards the trees and stopped dead, seeing a black strip of film hanging from a branch. I slammed my hand to my side pocket, the pocket I kept the exposed film in, and felt only two rolls of film through the fabric. I had lost one in my hammock or running around the village. The last one, unexposed, was in my camera. Simultaneously, I saw my camera. A pet woolly monkey had it clutched to its chest with one hand while climbing with the other. It reached a safe height, sat on a branch, and with its toes pulled the rewind knob and the camera flew open. The Barragudo clutched the camera in its feet and pulled the film out. Hand over hand, it tore out the film and threw it away. The film floated just a few inches and then got tangled in the foliage. I stood and watched my camera being destroyed. Finally, the monkey tossed it away the little black box fell, bumping against the branches. Through the afternoon and the evening, my cramps diminished. I slept intermittently till I thought I was dreaming of a jaguar. When I woke up, my first impression was that he was actually in the village. I could hear his grunt. Not only in the darkness around me, I could hear it inside my head. The animal heaved the air out of its lungs with short, powerful emissions as if the beast looking around was finding reasons for its discontent. A jaguar in the village. As I listened to its grunt, I only thought of the jaws that could snap my jugular vein like a pair of scissors. The beast kept grunting, sounding like it had gotten stuck in the passage between two huts. A fierce thrashing sound seemed to come from its tail, whipping against a bamboo wall. The noise of the village tripled in volume. In a few seconds, red chiefs kept shouting until six or seven young men brandishing spears ganged up in the middle of the clearing. He clearly gestured for me to join them. We were immediately forced into single file. The grunt ran out. The beast apparently ran ahead of us, changing direction. But red cheeks seemed to guess the turns it was taking for he kept the grunt straight ahead of us all the time. Hey, hey, I heard him shout unexpectedly. I got closer and found the young warriors stopped before a spiny thickness, which they were lighting with their torches. Maybe the beast growling and bristling had crawled underneath. Red cheeks shut suddenly pushed me. Powered by my own run, I bullseyed into it. Red cheeks immediately stopped his torch and stepped onto it with his hardened foot. The other burning branches vanished at the same instant. I plucked the barbs out of my skin as best I could, wondering if they were poisonous. I couldn't get all of them out. Several were embedded right between my shoulder blades. I broke the stems, but the tip stayed in my skin. And in the process, I lacerated my right hand to bleeding. I moved it in the air to try and coagulate the blood and, st and took stock of my plight. I was lost in the forest. I was imprisoned by the uncharted virgin growth. And if I didn't make it back to the village, 
assuming that my ingenious expulsion had not been ordered by Barnacle. I could die ten times over before anyone even expected, sorry, even suspected my presence here. Where is the river? The shamans kept him in the hut, fed him, sucked the demons out of his head several more times and massaged his body. He slept intermittently, woke up, slept again. When he reeled out of the hut, it was morning and he saw a mound of objects in the middle of the clearing. Tools, mostly axes, manioc graters, calabashes for drinking and cooking. The shamans were walking from hut to hut, talking to the people in them who later stepped out and threw more objects on the pile. It seemed to Lauren that they did it contritely. He saw Tutti carrying a batch of arrows seven feet long, tips well sharpened, ends decorated with red parrot fluff. Onto the pile. Lauren saw Zonia. She looked surprisingly unkempt and dazed and her eyes were puffy. The stare the explorer remembered as voraciously vital, now dull and unfocused. The thought hit him like a punch in the solar plexus. Zonia wasn't just mourning for her lover, Red Cheeks. It was her own death that he saw chiselled in her flesh. It was everyone's death that carved the other faces. The actors on this stage were giving their last performance. Lauren sat by the pile of tools and weapons his, eye, his eyes reviewing it abstractedly. If this pile was destined to be destroyed or left behind, the, the tribe was depriving it itself of two commodities, ordinarily too important to forsake. What was happening? The flames rose, everyone came out and under the headman's stare, the men stepped over to the piled up tools and weapons and started breaking them with their feet. What things they couldn't destroy with their hardened feet, they picked up and bent with their hands or snapped against their knees, sometimes helping each other. They ground the pots, snapped the bows and arrows, finally shattering the whole pile into bits of clay and wood, bones and the bows and arrows, finally shattering the whole pile into bits of clay and wood, bones of feather and husks, loose human teeth and necklaces. If this was some kind of ritual, their gestures were not mystical and everything was done without chanting or dancing. Finally, they were left with a mound of rubble. Into the fire it went without a hesitation or a look of regret. Then something came into my mind. They were holding them still, or something to that effect. It became a clear, absorbable statement before I knew it. They were right in front of me, the tribe's possessions. Everything, everyone had lumped onto the fire. I was curious and aware of being curious. Controlled lab conditions, standing here awake, unintoxicated, staring away from the headman, waiting, finding his messages in my brain, fitting them to the situation and checking whether they were compatible. He seemed to say that the objects held them still and by destroying them, they were able to set themselves in motion. I made myself think, fine, so you're burning up all this to get rid of its burden and be able to get going again. Very good. Heading where? To the beginning, he beamed again, stubbornly, self-evidently. All right, I made myself think. I don't care. Let's go. Let's go to your goddamn beginning. And what are we going to find in that beginning? Suddenly I realised that his answer may be death. Death was waiting for us in the beginning. The scene oddly reminded me of a scene in Arlington, Virginia, the bonfire in Greer, Greer Briar Stadium at the close of the Yorktown high school year. I kept watching it, playing with the notion of being held still in time by possessions. That seemed to be the logic of the ritual. Imagine us, 
I chuckled silently, burning our possessions not to remain still in time. I pictured bonfires like this one on some affluent American street, everyone dragging out paid for belongings, furniture, appliances, toys, and feeding them to a purifying fire. All of a culture, the most materialistic and leisure-minded in the world, onto the fire, spraying gasoline, dropping matches, watching it all burst in flames. In my mind, I saw flames spring up in a front yard and another and another, all along the street, all through the neighborhood and the next neighborhood. I pictured the town to be Washington, all of Foggy Bottom, Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House on fire, all freeing itself, taking off, soaring, carried by the vehicle of sacrificial, purifying flames. Soon after that, they set the huts on fire. Red Cheek's body would go up in flames with them, loaded with minimal utensils and carrying the children who couldn't keep pace, the, the tribe formed another marching column. Barnacle watched me, maybe curious to see whether I'd join them or not. Why curious? Was he not aware of my plight? I rolled up my hammock, packed knife and little book in the crumpled pockets of my stained and battered pants and lined up with the tribesmen. Like a good civilizado, without other choices, we started. By nightfall, I felt so tired that I could hardly keep my eyes open. I rigged up my hammock and slid in. It seemed that I had dozed for exactly a minute when someone leaned against my hammock and wiggled it. I opened my eyes again and saw Cambio's face. Oh, chef, eh? the headman. Suddenly awake, I threw my legs out of the hammock. There was a fire on the floor and a youngster stood by the back wall holding a torch. Between them, these sources of light splashed their glow onto Barnacle's face. With looking, without looking up, Barnacle spoke briefly and Cambio translated his words with a question. You have come to us. Why? I answered carefully that I'd heard of their tribe and wanted to photograph it. I made a living by traveling and seeing things and capturing them on film for others to see. Barnacle wondered why I had not left the tribe again. I answered that I had chosen to stay because I wanted to witness their beginning. That provoked some confusion. Cambio started to translate, then stopped and turned to ask me whether I meant the beginning, nascente, of the river, to which I answered that I was interested in river sources, for I expected to learn something from visiting them, but this time I meant their ritual. I repeated that I was interested in their beginning. I have never experienced anything like their beginning. I asked the headman, whether his people have sailed back in time before? The answer is negative. Barnacle never witnessed this type of ritual, but his father, a chief in his time, described it to him in detail. We're going back to the beginning. We'll be there soon. So where exactly is the beginning, I ask? Here, all around us, if it's right here, why do we still have to go back to it? If it's right here, we're in the beginning already. Not yet, he says. What if, I ask, we go back only to find out that the beginning is over? Barnacle blinks perplexed and then starts laughing. The beginning cannot be over. It has a duration of its own, unaffected by what follows after it. The beginning lies at the inception of time, populated by all the gods and models of all objects and beings. But this inception of time seems to be something else than the world's fresh first stretch of duration shooting forth into the future. Though the beginning lies at the beginning of time, it is also present anywhere along the course of time. It seems that though the beginning lies at the beginning, it is also present elsewhere, 
In fact, it is the companion of regular time and can be reached by any number of doorways, which are the rituals. While all this is explained and also sketched with the hands in the air, Barnacle and the other shamans listen and seem to agree, I suppose, that the more the shamans improve on the concept, the more all of them feel that it is real. But I realise it and feel no particular shock or panic. I feel the same. Each improvement adds to the reality of this encounter which adds to the reality of the beginning. Whatever it is, it is getting more real by the minute. I stop listening, try to evaluate my own feelings about it, identify a core of anxiety. After all, these people might go through the stages of the ritual only to make themselves die at the end. But otherwise, I want the beginning to be real. I do, as if I were one of them. I puff on the green cigar and feel high and crazy. My hosts are crazy too. We are all crazy together. The muddy tributary announces itself with an indifferent rustle of water and Barnacle stands on the low bank and breaks a branch blocking his view. All around us the forest exudes aromas of hot midday and busy biotic transactions. Barnacle whispers one word, and I think it means look, because he points upstream. I look upstream. The murmuring vein of water enters the landscape some 500 years from where we are standing, gushing in between two higher banks and then easing into a succession of pools. A series of pockets of still water crossed lazily by the main current an invisible change of lenses seems to occur and my eyes tumble forward and 500 yards and 500 years extend while the sound of the water changes. It really isn't sound anymore, but a signal to all my senses, a passing in which distance and time combine. I sense the distant mountains rising behind the backdrop of trees. The beginning of the river is also there the source of the river. Barnacle turns towards me, but before he can speak or gesture, my mind receives a message that comes from the source and is wordless, but so gigantic that it breaks all boundaries. It fills all the space outside me and inside me, and it fuses the source and the beginning into one notion, the beginning beams Barnacle, and his message is a part of the broader message. I nod, mesmerised, expecting the curtain of trees to part so that I can see the gigantic beam, or hear it, or register it in some way, some other familiar way. I see and hear nothing, but I feel how the beaming expands, ramifies and builds on itself. It has already engulfed everything. I am beginning to react like a man of the forest. Soon enough, I will invest the trees and the animals with supernatural powers. What I know about my old rational self will visit me now and then, like my old obsession with the river's source. I'll discover that source here in a ritual. I'll be who I was, except that I'll satisfy my ambitions and quests differently. That, after all, is the only way in which I'm different from these people. Finally, time starts moving again. Barnacle and I face each other and he explains, still without words, that he cannot allow me to leave, not after I have been part of this. Thank you.